Good morning, everyone. And now, as I say, for something completely different. A very, very brief history of the internet. Many school children believe the earth began. Dinosaurs came. Who are first? The internet was born. And finally, humans evolved just in time to prevent air cushion sneakers. But in fact, the internet didn't even exist in the time of Henry VIII. The U.S. Defense Department embarked on a grand experiment in long-distance network computing. They call it ARPANET. Networking allowed defense researchers to share expensive supercomputers. And during the height of the Cold War, it also meant that in the event of total nuclear violation, at least we wouldn't lose all our data. Years passed, the idea caught on. Other networks were created, sprawling into a gigantic parallel of connectivity. There was something for everybody on the internet. It was widely used by scientists. <laughs> Business people. <laughs> Students. <laughs> Dairy farmers. <laughs> and of course, perverts. <laughs> it was an information superhighway. <laughs> what would they think of next? Sparky, how about something with a bunch of dummies? The World Wide Web was a whole new way of navigating the net. Suddenly, all the world was like one great big CD bar. Some visionaries began to see the web as a perfect medium for business, potentially even more lucrative than spam. What does the future hold? That, ladies and gentlemen, is up to you. I thought it would be interesting for us to all start out this session, which is on web design, with a very thorough documentary history of the internet. So now we're all level set and we can proceed from here. So I'm going to talk about designing for the web, user paradigms, the evolving user design paradigms for doing e-business on the web. And I'm going to talk about it with respect to the evolution that we're undergoing from the traditional graphical user interface, or GUI, through to the evolving design paradigms the users experience when they're surfing the web and doing e-business on the web, doing transactions, etc. I'm going to use some analogies. We have an analogy with an iceberg we've used for many years that hopefully will plant a mental picture in your mind that you can walk away with because it makes some very important points about what's important in doing design for ease of use. I'm going to talk about some design models, give you a few approaches that we have found to be very beneficial over the years in our work in designing within IBM. We've communicated with a lot of other of our colleagues in the field, and in general, we're finding these approaches to be very valuable. I'm going to show you some of those. I can't possibly tell you about all of them today. I'm going to give you a little insight on how we're doing some web design, some approaches, methodologies, and then give you some references at the end so you can follow up on your own. Uh, those of you who are in the field can follow up on your own. For everyone else, I want to give you an overall appreciation for what are the factors that go into a good design, a lot of these you probably have experienced personally, maybe subconsciously. You'll use a design and say, I felt very comfortable with that. I felt that it was intuitive. I was able to understand it easily and accomplish what I wanted to accomplish very easily and quickly. And I'll show you maybe some reasons why that's true. And maybe you'll appreciate when you look at a design from now on what some of the elements are behind it that made it easy to use or difficult to use. So to begin with, I want to use an analogy to help the designers here understand what's really important in a design. And how do you go about parceling out the aspects of any particular design, whether it be a computer system or the control panel in a car, the instrument panel in a car, or even a vending machine interface. A lot of these fundamental concepts still apply quite well. First of all, we break the interface into three sets of aspects, the visual aspects, the interaction aspects, and what we call the user's object model. It'll become quite apparent to you in just a moment why I use an iceberg analogy to make this point. The visual aspects are those aspects of the interface conveyed visually. They present the user with elements like cues, visual cues. A cue is something where you, the designer is trying to communicate to the user some aspect of the design, oftentimes an aspect that will enable an interaction, such as visual cues today in GUIs are the 3D look of push buttons. 
It's going to make the button say, press me. Okay? That's a cue. Now, obviously, when the user takes an action, we want to provide some feedback, telling them that we recognize your action, we're acting upon it. In the case of a simple button press, you notice a 3D effect. The user pushes on the button, it appears to go in and come back out. That's an immediate visual cue. And then if the action that is kicked off by that user action is going to take a little while, we typically will put up some sort of a time indicator, a progress indicator, a bar that shows you progress or something else to give you feedback about you have initiated an action, it's in progress, it's going to complete in so many minutes, hopefully, and so forth. The visual aspects also include elements like color, the use of typography, all of the stylistic attributes. So there's a lot of aesthetics involved in the visuals. The next major aspect of the design is called the interaction techniques. Now that includes things like the keyboard mapping, where are the functions mapped to in the keyboard. It's the menu mappings. If you look at the menu bar and how the, the drop downs in a GUI interface work, it's all those aspects, how the user interacts with the interface. Um, menu organizations and keyboard mappings, et cetera, is sort of the syntactic language through which a user communicates with the interface. And ultimately, what we have below the waterline on the iceberg model is what we call the user's object model or the conceptual model. The conceptual model is those things that the user has to understand conceptually. The objects that are presented to them in the interface, what those objects do, how the user uses them, what they can do for the user, their properties and actions. Now, think about the interfaces we have today in the GUI world. A typical object model includes things like folders, and if you're a Windows user, you have something called shortcuts, and you know that folders reside in these directory structures, and there's a whole set of concepts. That's just in the Windows environment itself. You get into applications like a Word or a WordPro or a PowerPoint or Freelance, there's another set of concepts there that you have to understand. In a presentation, you have to understand there's a backdrop or some sort of a background for every slide. And you can modify it, but you modify it independently of the foreground for each slide. So there's these sets of concepts. And that's where we believe the major amount of usability exists. And that's where the major source of problems can come from. So over the years, those of us who have practiced in this field for quite a while, we have corroboration from others in the field, we've sort of assigned some value numbers to these three aspects of any particular system. And we believe about 10% of the overall usability comes from the visual aspect, about 30% from the interaction, and 60% from the conceptual model, the user's model. The user has to get it right up here first. Because the user, when they walk up to a particular system, they have a set of goals in mind. They want to accomplish something. They've been led to believe by the advertisements or their friends that they can accomplish a certain kind of, of activity, do a certain task. So they have a, a model up here, a goal-based model. Their task is to map that to the mechanisms provided by the system. Okay? And they have to first understand what's in this user's object model how do I use, what can the system do for me? How do I utilize it? Then they can talk to the system via the visuals and the interaction techniques. So overall, we believe that the look and feel, this is a very common term in the industry, look and feel is the tip of the iceberg. So when you hear somebody talk about the look and feel, remember this, position it. It's the tip of the iceberg. What's really important is that users understand this conceptual underlying model. And that has to be conveyed somehow to users. Now, just a little side story here. Um, yesterday, I spent some time with some seniors from Heritage Village down in Southbury. And we were talking to them to understand what their problems are in, in approaching computers and information technology in general. And they actually hit on this without any prompting at all. They said, look, when we, when we teach, and this was seniors teaching other seniors. So when we teach seniors, we find it inadequate to tell them well, to do something in the computer, you go here and you click on this icon, or you click on this menu and a choice comes down and you click on this one, and that doesn't work because they have no framework. They can't develop a mental picture of what it is they're trying to accomplish. So they made it very important that they have to develop this framework and they were really begging for some educational approaches to help them understand how to do that. And that's very important is what they're really talking about is that they have to have that conceptual model. Now we can also look at as designers, where are the levers? Where are the pressure points in allowing us to impact these aspects of our designs? And if you think about it for a second, look and feel traditionally has been driven 
by the platform on which you are developing. So if you're developing on a Windows platform or a Unix CDE platform, you're given a UI toolkit, which consists of things like entry fields and radio buttons and drop-down list, etc. So that is an element that the designer is given, pretty much to start with in the graphical user interface world, that sort of dictates a lot of the look and feel aspects. There's also things called style guides. A style guide is really tells a designer how to use all those user interface widgets, presumably to create an easy to understand and use interface. Okay? So remember, but that's only the conversation part. That's only the language part, the linguistics of the interface. If the user can't figure out what it is they can say to that interface to accomplish their work, they're no further ahead just by knowing how to talk to the system. The user concepts, the conceptual model, comes much deeper. It comes from the environment, the user environment in which you're working. So for example, a Unix environment, common uh, CDE, common desktop environment, or a Windows environment, 95, 98 NT, they all bring with them a user model, some fundamental characteristics of the system, how it works, things like the directories represented as folders and so forth. Those are the fundamental concepts that users have, that's their framework. They have to gain an understanding of that, and then when they add an application, such as a PowerPoint or a Quicken, then they have to add to their model the sets of objects and capabilities provided by that application. So we're concentrating, we've been concentrating over the last uh, decade or so on techniques for helping users understand these conceptual models, develop this framework in their mind so they can more easily approach an application. We know that the look and feel aspects are changing, they're evolving. Okay? They're changing with, with uh, the uh, little personal digital assistant kind of devices, they're changing even on the uh, CRT and LCD displays, we're seeing different styles, the web is certainly a new style, but even on the web there's a model behind the application you're talking to. Now a little bit about this evolution. Even back in the days of the command line, in the early 80s, there was this need to have the mental model. Matter of fact, it was even stronger then, because the only way you could deal with the system was through this arcane language, C colon, and you'd have to type change derb. Well, how did you know what to type? You had to have this model in your mind that there's a directory structure, and all my data and all my programs reside somewhere in this directory structure, and there's this concept of the current directory, and any command I tell the system to do is going to look in the current directory. There was a whole set of these rules. That was the framework that you had to memorize. It all had to be up here. And then the language, the look and feel, was very, very simple. But the problem was it put so much load, cognitive load, in people's minds, it was very difficult to use because it was all memory. You had to memorize everything. So then in the uh, mid-'80s, we came along with the idea of Xerox, and then Apple, and eventually everyone went to the GUI. Okay? A GUI, a graphical user interface, tries to address those aspects of the language, the look and feel aspects. Because rather than relying on people's memory, it now allowed them to rely on recall, which is much easier for people. Once they see something and recognize it, uh, they can recall it much more easily than if they have to remember it. So the GUI basically just addressed the look and feel aspects and gave us a candy coating veneer, if you will, on top of the ease of use problem. Later on in the late 80s, uh, several of us got together under Tony's direction back in about 88 and started asking ourselves the question, what, what, how do we get to this fundamental model? And we addressed it from the viewpoint object-oriented programming was evolving at that point in time. And it looked like it had some good disciplines that we could sort of use as a, as a model here in our own work. We said, what if we had an object-oriented user interface? What if we shifted the user's focus from running programs to working with their data? So they didn't really have to worry about which program do I use? They just find their data, my calendar, my tax return, okay? my sales analysis report for January. And they just worry about that and not so much the actual program itself. And we spent several years developing what's, what's been come to be called now the object-oriented user interface, which you see a, a lot of the aspects of in today's modern operating systems, such as Win 95, 98, NT, OS2, CDE, we worked across that period of time with, uh, with everybody involved in those operating systems, and the ideas really have caught on and spread. Now, the problem even with that approach, and, and that model of the object-oriented user interface really talks about and defines things like the, the folder view and, uh, and how everything is automated so that the user doesn't see 
programs unless they want to. You can define these shortcuts, called shortcuts or aliases and other systems and so forth, to your data. And when you use one of these shortcuts, uh, all it is is just it looks like a folder. It looks like an item in a folder. And when you click on it, it launches the correct program. So all you have to have is you, you develop some scheme that you're comfortable with for storing your data and accessing your data. And then you don't worry about all the infrastructure in the system behind that. The problem is that also is sort of a one-size-fits-all mentality. Okay? It's sort of the, the brown bag approach or the, the plain paper wrapper approach. What we found in talking to a lot of customers is that we had been working for a long time on this theory that we're designing these interfaces for knowledge workers. Okay? They told us, many of them quite strongly, that 80% of their workers were what they considered to be production workers. And that is they had a set of tasks to do same day every day, same set of tasks, and they wanted interfaces designed specifically for that person for that set of tasks. And only a small portion of the workers were general knowledge workers who could use a general purpose desktop like we were talking about designing back in the 80s. So we came to the conclusion back then that ultimately we had to evolve the desktop to be a user tailorable desktop built out of components somehow so that, for example, insurance companies, banks, financial institutions, retail, uh, manufacturing could create custom built desktops and not just for their industry segment but for certain job classifications within their industry like a claims analyst. Okay? And, and we worked with some insurance companies for a while trying to design a claims analyst desktop. And there were some prototypes done in small talk and so forth. And there were very specialized desktops with specialized in baskets and out baskets and business policies built into the behaviors of some of the objects. And, uh, and it was quite promising. And since then, uh, a lot of that work has been done and they've been building specialized desktops. But an insurance company doesn't want to be in the business of building desktops. Okay? Maybe configuring one out of some parts might be okay. But eventually what we saw happening in the industry, um, we always have to, to, to sort of figure out in the industry which technology are we going to ride, which technology is going to allow us to implement the designs that we know users need. And we used to think it was going to be a component-based desktop. Then the web sort of came along and hit with great force. And this uh, topic called web tops, which is basically the ability to create a customized user environment like a desktop, but it's but called a web top. That capability came along. And for a while, we thought, well, it looks like it's going to be the web top. Because with a web top, you could provide each different user. They'd go to a certain site, and they'd see a completely customized environment for dealing with that site. So you might have somebody dealing with the manufacturing or the fulfillment aspects of your business have a completely unique web top or web site for doing their work, custom built with their aspects on it. Now, as the evolution of the web is continuing, and some of these techniques are becoming more mature, and we're finding some aren't as, aren't as well fitted to what needs to happen as others, it looks like it's going to be maybe more like a portal. So you see these portals starting to rise, and portals seem to be starting to have special purposes as well. I think one thing we can say in general is it's not going to be the traditional GUI. Now, Tony made this point already that we're, we're departing. There's a lot more freedom on the web Freedom's a good thing. It's, it has two edges to it. Freedom can create a lot of inconsistent, sort of anarchist kind of approaches that'll just confuse users. So we do have to have some standards. We have to develop some good practices and have some guidelines. And that's what we're going to talk about a little more in just a moment. It's interesting, those of us who have been in this industry for a long time, we keep anticipating what is it going to take for these products that we're developing in this industry to evolve from where they were useful only by a technologist, the geeks who invented it, all the way through to a consumer. What's it going to take to turn that corner on that curve? And we keep using analogies from the automobile, and a lot of people do too. James Flanagan said in 94, uh, the home computer, centerpiece of an emerging industry with enormous possibilities, is right now where the automobile was in 1919 on the verge of a takeoff that will make it a familiar product in 80% of American homes within five years and a necessity of life within a decade. So we keep asking ourselves, there's a lot of analogies here. When cars first came out, they were used only by technologists. They didn't have standard systems of steering wheels and, and brakes and throttle. The throttles were on the steering shaft. 
In, in, in many cars, the steering mechanism was like a tiller, a lever, like a tiller on a boat, or even rain. The very first ones were reins from the horse and buggy days, and the brakes were levers and so forth. It took a long time for the car to standardize. Once the elements, the key elements of the interface, the essential elements of using it, making it accessible by everyone, started to standardize, that's when the automobile turned the curve. Now, where are we today? Well, just a few months ago, John Dvorak pointed out that it's sort of the Model T syndrome. You, you reboot your PC often enough, and it starts up, and we've still got a lot of problems. But I think for many of us, we feel we're still right on the knee of that curve, we're ready to turn the curve. We now understand a lot of the fundamental principles that will allow us to turn the curve. One of the sets of, of principles that we follow in doing design in IBM, and a lot of other people follow the, uh, the same set uh, to, a, to a closer uh, or, or less close level of detail, is acknowledging that there are three models that we have to deal with. The first is what we call the user's conceptual models. That's the set of beliefs that every user, all of us, carry around in our head about how something works. What makes it work? When we walk up to something as simple as a vending machine, and there's a model there, and we see a code in the item we want, and there's a keypad, and we have to figure out how to key the keypad, there's a simple model there. If we then go to another vending machine that has a different scheme, we either have to modify the scheme we understand or learn a new one, okay? And that can be easier or more difficult. So what we carry around up here is based on what our goals are, what we're trying to accomplish, our emotional states, our beliefs, and it contains things called superstitions. And we all have superstitions in dealing with systems, especially computers. Oh, well, I closed my Word application and Norton Antivirus started running. Hmm, I guess there was a, it, it must be checking my document that, that when I saved it, it's going to check it right quick. Uh, that's, that's a superstitious behavior. And we all have those superstitions, and they, they stem from a lack of completely understanding what's going on in the system. In other words, the model that the designers intended for us to understand. So what we try to do is we try to develop very distinctly, unambiguously, what we call a designer's model. Now, the designer's model is that set of things that the user is going to be given in order to do their job. It's the objects that they'll be given, that they'll see on the screen. It's what those objects can do, how they appear, how the user can interact with them. You can think of this designer's model as being the intended user model. If everything goes right, we build the designer's model in such a way it does what the users need it to do. They find it intuitive and easy to learn. And after they operate with the system for a while, their conceptual model up here matches the designer's model. That's the goal. Okay? We try to separate the implementer's model, the programmer's model, the graphics artist who, who may be uh, coding in some graphics design language, try to separate their aspects, which are like data structures, which toolkit components are they using, which algorithms, which function libraries. We separate that out into what's called an implementer's model, and we make a hard line between the designer's model and the implementer's model. The designer's model has only aspects that we expect the user to see and hope they understand and use and make it the product easy to use. So we try to factor those models into the overall development process. Now, Carl's talked a bit about the process. I'm going to take it one step further. Okay? And Tony also mentioned that if we uh, pay the expense up front, we put the emphasis up front in the design phase, it's going to save us a lot in the long term. Okay? And we're working on methodologies to help that happen. Uh, Tony also said that if you get the design right, then you don't have to worry about it that much in development. But you do have to worry about conveying it accurately and unambiguously to the developers. So even if the designers get a design right, we have to have a way of handing it off and then validating it in a way that validates it's still correct. So what we do is we go through a process of discovery, and Carl mentioned task analysis. Task analysis is a technique that's well known in the field. Uh, and there's a lot of different techniques for doing it. You can go out and, and talk to your users. You can make hierarchical trees like we've shown here. What are the tasks that users do? And break each task down into subtasks and do goal analysis and so forth. The tricky part for us in the design field is in taking that body of knowledge and mapping it into a design. And then documenting the design in a way that we can all get around it and say, yeah, is that the kind of thing that users need? and maybe somehow take it out to users and ask them, is this the kind of thing you think would solve your problem? 
And when the answers to those questions are yes, then taking it to, a, to an implementer, a developer, in such a way that it gets implemented exactly as we specified it. Okay? That's been a very tricky problem. And what we've hit on in the last several years is an approach that we call OVID, Object View Interaction Design, which starts to make this process of design, designing for the user, more of a science, more of an engineering aspect than traditionally it has been, which has been more like art. Now, the way we do that is we looked around in the field and saw that there were a lot of software engineering disciplines and approaches that were, had the very similar problem. Because in software engineering, it's got to be very rigorously defined, unambiguously defined, and communicated, and so forth, the, uh, the software engineering model. So we said, can we use some of those tools and approaches? And we started uh, using an approach called UML, Universal Modeling Language, and some of the tools um, some of the tools are like Rational Rows and Visio Enterprise that give you the ability to do diagrams. And that's what this is representing here down the lower right hand corner is a diagram of the user model that we want the users to develop. Now obviously the goal then again is as every user experiences the interface through their observations with the implementation that each of them deduce the correct model so their conceptual models that each one of them is building up here in their head is a correct depiction of the model that the designer intended them to understand. Now obviously different users are going to have different levels of understanding. Some will be what we call more naive than others. Others will be very astute. And we can talk about what the advantages are. The, the more you understand the model, the more capable a user you'll be, the more efficient user you'll be. If you have a problem, you'll understand alternative strategies on how to get around it and, uh, and continue your work. Now, just a, a chart to show an example of what we have learned how to do is model a user interface. And what we've been concentrating on recently is how to apply this technique to doing web design. And we're very excited about using this technique for web design. We've designed a, a site for travel, selling travel packages. Okay, and we did it using this approach. We're evolving the approach as we go because our approach was originally developed to do graphical user interface design, GUI design. Now we're ad adapting it for web design, which is a bit different. So what we do is we model all the objects. We identify the objects from task analysis, just like before. Our process allows us to look at the user goals and the merchant goals at the same time and factor those both into the design. It's still independent of implementation aspects. What we're modeling here is exactly what we want the user to be aware of. Not how they're going to be aware of it yet, just all the concepts that the user will have to be aware of. In the case of a travel site, you've got travel packages. You've got package components such as the airline travel and the hotel uh, accommodations. Um, you've got concepts like, can I register at the site? So if I come there again, it reuses the information I provided previously. Can I take a previous trip and just change a few things on it and use it again with a different date and so forth? So all those aspects are built into this model. And we derive all the same benefits as you derive in software engineering from doing this modeling approach. We can identify opportunities for reusing. We can identify components and then say, we can reuse this component. I don't have time to go into all the detail here, but we've got aspects of travel destination, local transportation, airline travel, hotel, local activities. And those elements are used in multiple places in the design here. Okay, so it gives us a great capability to reuse aspects of the design. And where that shows up is we do something called a web map, which is really a logical model of the website. And when we start to map those objects into web pages, those web pages start to take on the aspects of a template. So we can have a template for a web page, and we start to get a lot of reuse of the design by using these templates uh, over and over again in different places. So when, the, uh, when we're building a website, the person building a, a particular travel package will have a template for specifying what are the activities available at a particular destination we're talking about, say, Orlando. So we've got Disney World, for example, and SeaWorld. Uh, what are the, the airline accommod and accommodation and local travel capabilities? Well, there'll be templates for filling in that information. Well, when a person goes to book a package on the site, they'll see 
a page derived from the same template but with slightly different information tailored by the person who designed the site. When they actually do the booking, part of their booking report, the actual uh, reservations and everything else will be yet another version of that same template. So we start to see a great possibility for, for the reuse benefits. And of course, we map this kind of uh, a process of doing object view interaction design into the overall process that, that Carl mentioned. Uh, we use a process called integrated uh, product development. And this is sort of it in a nutshell. We do architecture during which we define the elements that we want the user to see. The views, not how they're rendered, not how they actually look, but logically what, what are the groupings of elements that users need to see to do their task. And the paths that users need to take through the system and then the interaction techniques. And we carry that on into the design process. And in the design process, we'll do storyboards, and then on into production where the renderings are actually generated. In parallel to this, we're doing UCD to do the validations. And you'd be surprised, even at the very early, early stages of design, once you have one of those models that I just showed you, you can do things like a structure analysis. You can ask users, is this a logical structure? Is this the way you think about categorizations of products and services? Okay, when you go shopping for a certain uh, product. Is this a good navigation technique? If you, if you have to go from here to here to here to get to what you want, is, is that, does that seem acceptable? And so there's a lot of validation you can do throughout the process. One of the major factors in doing a methodical design this way is we're generating a description of the design that is complete and unambiguous. And this is a major rallying point for the communications of the multidisciplinary team that Carl mentioned. Remember, we're bringing together uh, disparate disciplines here. They have to find a single method for communication that they can all understand. And we've still got a few things yet to define here. These diagrams are good for some of the members of the team to work from, but a graphics designer wouldn't be expected to work from these UML diagrams. This would be more for your, your uh, HTML implementers, your system architects to work from. So we're defining right now processes and forms like annotated storyboards that we can give off to the graphics designers, take each one of these blocks in that web diagram and turn it into an annotated storyboard and give it to the graphics designer. Now, the architecture that, that we are developing, we've layered into three sets of tasks. And you'll be able to watch this roll out on our website over time. So if you want to get the 10,000 foot level, we basically divided all the tasks into three areas. E information task, which is doing enough to tell others about your business using the web. If we add the ability to do buying and selling kind of transactions there, which includes things like a shopping cart and a transaction process to actually do the purchase and fulfillment information and confirmation. When we add those sets of tasks, we call that the e-commerce e level of enablement, okay? Buying and selling products online. Finally, ultimately, over time, we're going to grow this architecture to describe the entire e-business process, which is running your business, relationships with vendors, suppliers, employees, as well as customers. So we're creating essentially a full roadmap on our website for creating usable business-oriented websites. And we'll put that into perspective from this point on. First, I just want to mention a few typical problems. I'm going to start talking now about some of the guidelines for development and give you some references. Some of these problems have been pervasive. Some of them are not getting better. Uh, we need to put a lot of emphasis on the fact that users still have a difficult time recognizing links. Uh, the, links, the link text is typically not descriptive enough in a lot of cases. Users take a link. It's very aggravating when a user takes a link and they don't get to where they expect it to be because it, it, the, the link term was misleading to them. We find that frequently. And that leads to the point that they can't find what they're looking for. Um, you know, web, web sites are cross-linked in so many different ways. It's like a twisty little maze of passages to a lot of users. There are strategies. Users oftentimes have strategies, and if you design your website to facilitate those strategies by having done the proper task analysis and meeting with users up front, you can guide a user straight down the path that they need to go to accomplish what they want to do. Okay? And they won't get lost or distracted or sidetracked. Too many web pages today try to address everyone's need in one web page. At one point in time, I counted the number of links on, on Amazon.com's homepage, and it was over 90 links on the homepage alone. And now, if you know what you want to do, you've been to that site before, and you know how to use it, it can be very efficient. Because you can go in there and you know, well, I'll go down to the lower right-hand corner where I know my link is, and I'll be right there. But for a novice user, somebody going there for the first time, it is daunting. Okay? 
Another thing that I heard from the, from the Heritage Village seniors yesterday is they'll click on something and they'll be off on another site completely and they don't realize it. And it's infuriating to them by the time they find this out. So there's a banner on the page. It happens to be an advertisement. They don't realize that. They click on it and they're now off since in some ad. And they realize many minutes later that they've, they've gone down a sidetrack. They didn't want to be on it and it's very aggravating. It's aggravating to everyone, not just seniors. And of course, people can't remember URLs. Uh, we have proposed a scheme on our website for structuring a URL. We did user studies and found out what people expected by watching what they typed in on, a, on an address line, and we've developed a proposed architecture for URLs. They have trouble finding the same information again. They're overwhelmed by search results and difficulty printing what they want. These sound familiar? These, this slide is actually two years old. I left it in here because these are still problems. Okay? We have strategies for dealing with a lot of these problems, and I hate to say it again, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. There's lots of additional problems. And now we add e-commerce, and there's, there's even more problems. And we have strategies for dealing with a lot of these problems. We don't have to continue living with these problems and making users live with them. A lot of this information is defined on our website. I'm going to give you pointers locally. Michael's already done this once. You're going to see pointers to your own information internally. We do design guidelines. We do design guidelines for the design community at large. But we also make a distinction between principles, guidelines, and conventions. Principles are those fundamental ideals and beliefs that we use to, to guide decision making to achieve an overall result, to guide decision making. Then we boil those down a little bit further, distill them down to what we call guidelines, which are re recommended courses of action okay, to support the set of principles. And ultimately, we define things called conventions. Okay? You may refer to these as standards. These are specific agreed to practices. They're typically prescriptive. It says something like, we're going to make our logo 30 by 60 pixels, and we're going to put it in the upper right-hand corner of the screen, or we're going to put it at 0, 0 in the left-hand corner, or whatever. That's an example of a convention or standard. We're in the business on our site of providing the guideline level okay, for general consumption across the industry. Within IBM, we have our own standards or conventions for building internal IBM websites. They say things exactly like that. We're going to you put the IBM logo, IBM banner in the same place. Every page is going to contain these five items in this color, in this color palette, precisely. Okay? Now, you have your own set. It's at technetetna.com human factors. Okay? This is the set that you would be looking at to get the specific information for Aetna websites. Now, we're, we have this larger framework uh, that we're developing. It's all based on UCD principles. We're doing user studies. We've done user studies with everything from people buying clothing, buying CDs, buying books, and obviously all the way through to computers at a lot of different websites. We do focus groups. That's the decision support center approach that Carl showed you. We've done consulting with web grocery firms, banking firms, financial firms, et cetera. A lot of us, we live this experience. We, we buy things in our group constantly online. We participate in online auctions. Uh, one of our guys was the past president of Lewis Carroll Society. He just about lives on eBay. And, and I purchased my last automobile last year almost entirely over the web. So we live this every day. And we take what we live and take what we learn from users and practice it on our own website and try to distill it and put it out there as guidelines for everyone to see. Now, I won't go through all the details on these rankings. I want to give you some examples now of the kinds of things that you'll find in websites today and the kinds of things that we hit at on our website. We, through the user studies we did last year, were able to rank, and we had the users do this ranking, the major problems they found in websites. Things like credit card security was their number one concern when they're coming to a website to shop, uh, all the way down to having a usable search engine. Then there were some number of other categories that we did not do a ranking on for the user, but, but they mentioned them as problems. Then we pr proceed to develop a set of guidelines directly to address those kinds of problems. So at our website, you'll find a complete comprehensive set of ease of use design guidelines for websites covering all of these topics. And I'll just give you an example of the depth of the site. Um, that's the page that, because you can't read it, I exploded it up. There's a section on planning, which talks about everything from user analysis through scheduling, all the planning tasks that you need to do to build a website. 
design task with a lot of detail on how to, how to lay out the text, navigation, structure of the site, production aspects, such as how to accommodate the different levels of browsers that are out there, how to test it, how to roll it out, maintenance. And we just added the published site that just went up recently is a whole set of e-commerce considerations, customer support and trust, and uh, how to describe products, how to do the checkout process uh, with your customer. And this is just an example of some of the level of detail. Uh, I put some in the appendix. I knew I wouldn't have time to go through all of this, so I just gave you some examples. Uh, there's many more in the appendix, and uh, I invite you to go look at our site to get a general feel, but again, you need to go to the Aetna-specific site for what Aetna needs to do. Uh, one of the examples here is to avoid the flash screen. I know initially we saw when you, a lot of sites, when you went to the site, there would be a big, uh, almost a full screen logo of the site. Welcome to our site. A, a lot of people did this. Welcome to our site. Click here to enter. People don't want to have to do that. Got a lot of negative feedback on that. They want to go directly into the site where they can start picking what they want to do. It's just an extra click for them that didn't serve any purpose. They want to be able to get to an item within four clicks. We've got all this level of detail, and hopefully the way that, that you can use this site, get a general feel, look at the Aetna guidelines, but the developers of the Aetna guidelines should be able to take advantage of our guidelines and some of the research that we've done, as well as that that they're doing themselves. As ongoing activities, we're going to continue to develop our user scenarios. We have partnered with, uh, with other organizations. We've partnered with universities. We did quite an extensive study with Clemson University where we actually followed shoppers around in a CompUSA and, and other kinds of shopping and sort of got inside their head while they were shopping. And we learned their shopping strategies. And we did the same thing on the web. We sat down with them in a decision support center and watched how they did things and asked them questions. And we discovered what shopping strategies they use. And we can take that knowledge now and factor it into designs such that we facilitate those strategies and help them do what they want to do on the web as quickly as possible. Now, just a, a, uh, a point here about the Ovid technology. It is the Ovid methodology. It is documented. Uh, there is a text. You can look at your uh, handout package and get the actual uh, references here available generally online, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, etc. cetera. Uh, remember, this is the approach of designing using software engineering techniques for graphical user interfaces that we're now expanding to web design. Uh, if you're interested in the field, two very interesting books. Now, I mention these because these are not necessarily just for people in the design field. These are generally applicable books, some very entertaining anecdotes in both of them. One by Don Norman, The, Des the Design of Everyday Things about the design of water faucets and doorknobs and other things. And it makes all the key points that I've been making, but in a very uh, humorous and, and interesting to read kind of uh, format. And the other one, Set Phasers on Stun, is about some disasters. It, it's a collection of short stories about disasters that have occurred around the world because of design flaws, all the way from airplane crashes to Bhopal, India, and so forth. Uh, quite entertaining reading, a, a little bit chilling in some aspects. Uh, just one other reference for you is the, uh, the industry, the PC industry has gotten together last year and formed what's called an ease of use roundtable. Uh, we get together, it's, it's, the, it, it's uh, the operating system vendors and the hardware vendors and the OEMs, those of us making PCs, uh, Compaq, Dell, IBM, H, HP, and so forth, and we get together once a month and talk about what the ease of use issues are in the industry and how to attack them and whether there's something that one of us needs to do or something that we all need to do, et cetera. So there's a reference for you on the uh, ease of use roundtable. So finally, I'd like to leave you with the point. Again, the major point is at the bottom of this slide is to refer to the Aetna Human Factors Guidelines for Web Design, but make you aware of the importance of designing for the total user experience and the availability of all the resources that are out there in the form of general guidelines, resources and downloads, success stories, case studies, and exhibits and so forth. So thank you very much. And I guess um, we're now ready for the panel discussion.